Very cool. Good evening, everybody. And we are uh, looking today at the third out of seven churches, and that would be Pergamos or Pergamum. Only difference, same city, only difference is uh, Pergamos is uh, the Greek spelling or transliteration, whereas Pergamum is the uh, Latin spelling or Latin transliteration. So uh, I'm going to go with the Greek one just because that's uh, what I'm most familiar with. And uh, before we get into the text and, and speak more specifically about Pergamum, uh, let's just remember kind of what we're doing. We're talking about a letter, uh, and better to hear that as sort of an edict or a proclamation or a message from a king to his citizens. And, of course, the way we know it's citizens is by him using the word church. Church would have been understood as citizens. Uh, and those who had qualified to be citizens, and we qualify to do that by our faith in Jesus Christ. So uh, here I am at a Christian school up in Idaho and uh, ran into this. And I said, all right, that's going to be my uh, background for the evening uh, since we're talking about citizens in different places in the book of Revelation. Um what we're doing, though, is we're talking about the king, which we introduced in chapter one of Revelation. And the king, of course, is sending these messages or proclamations or edicts uh, to his people or citizens in the various cities. And he does that by dictating those messages to a scribe. The scribe would then uh, hand the message to the messenger and the messenger would deliver it to the citizens in the various cities. So. Um, we are on, like I said, church number three, and you need to know a few things about Perga, Pergamos before we uh, look at the text. Number one, it was one of the most prominent cities in, in Asia Minor at the time, and it was only second to Ephesus, which was the first church that we spoke about. So it's about, you know, if you go up the coast, you're, you start with Ephesus, you move up, then you go to Smyrna, then you move inland by about 20 miles, and you're going to run into Pergamos. It was known as a religious center because there were so many pagan temples all around the city. And those gods that they were dedicated to included Asclepius, Zeus, Persephone, Dionysus, Serapis, uh, Isis, uh, and Pergamos also had the distinction of the, being the first Roman city in the world to uh, dedicate a temple in honor of a Roman emperor, and that would have been the Emperor Augustus in 29 BC. So not all that long uh, before we've, you know, maybe 100 years before we would have seen something uh, like this letter. So uh, you may or may not know that the god Asclepius, or the Roman god Asclepius, or, or in Greek mythology, uh, was the, the god that was represented by the bar that has the two serpents around it that you may have seen in your doctor's office. And so when we read Pergamos and we see, I know where you're, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, uh, there are some people and some commentators who've said, well, that's probably the basis for that. And what we'll find out tonight is um, that there's there's a better answer there. And what you need to know is that the city of Pergamos was sort of built on a, on, a, on a hill, and there was a citadel in the middle of the hill, something like Athens and something like Jerusalem, actually. But on this hill was a temple to Zeus, and the temple to Zeus was, you know, because it was built up there, everybody around the city would be able to have looked at the city, looked at this uh, temple and seen whatever it was that they were looking at. And in this particular case, there was about a 120 by 112 foot uh, altar area in the middle of this temple to Zeus, and it was shaped like a huge throne. So what we'll find is that that was sort of indicative of the environment of the church there at Pergamos, that they were in the middle of uh, you know, they were dwelling in this area where there were all these pagan religions and pagan temples. And right in the middle of it is Satan's throne that everybody would have been able to see. But Jesus says, no, it's not Zeus's throne. It's Satan's throne. So 
Uh, one more thing you need to know before we dig into the text, and that is that the name Pergamos uh, is made up of two parts, and we'll find that it's very, very appropriate uh, in their environment because it's pair, which is excessive, the idea of excessive or too many, and gamos, which is the word for marriage. So you have excessive marriages or, or too many marriages. And we'll find that that's, it's another place, something like Smyrna, where it was myrrh and you know, that those ideas with the, the church at Smyrna. Uh, this is going to fit them very, very well. For those of you who have looked at the churches throughout history, you will know that this uh, represents the uh, marriage of the church, you know, the church as it existed with the church, with the uh, pagan uh, religions. And that was done by Constantine, where he would go up to the pagan temple priests and say, OK, now Christianity is the official religion. So you used to be, you know, yesterday you were the priest of the temple to Aphrodite. Today it's Jesus. So again, that idea of, of pulling those things together that really don't go together and, and the influence of the things around upon the truth and upon, uh, upon what is you know pure and right. And that's what we'll see this evening. All right, well, let's take a look. We know that the, the, each of the letters is built up of several parts and we already talked about the first one. I'm gonna pull up the text here and we'll begin. We see him say in verse 12, and again, this is chapter two of Revelation, to the angel of the church at Pergamos write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now, you know, we read that and go, okay, Jesus could have pulled from a lot of pieces of his description as king from Revelation one. Why would he pick this one? Well, um, you know, we, we know the end, of, we know the tail end of, the, of, of this, you know, next verse, but in terms of his, his self-description, you know, all right, sharp two-edged sword. Well, sharp two-edged sword by the Romans, that would have been a killing, you know, something that you use to kill someone. But from a spiritual or scriptural perspective, we know that Jesus is the one that holds that because that's a division between right and wrong, true and false, good and evil. Uh, and Jesus was the one to do that. We see that same idea, and you probably know this verse, in Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Fits perfectly with the need for discernment in Pergamos with all of these uh, pagan religions around and their influence, the influence that they would have had uh, upon the uh, the church there. So uh, that being said, and, and we'll find out how appropriate it is as we go on. Verse 13, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. And again, that repetition of the idea of, you know, that that altar area that they would have seen in the background as they're looking around the town. So um, he says here that Antipas was apparently a faithful martyr, and they would have known about that at the time that uh, John sent that to them, you know, with Jesus' words. But the problem is, we don't really know anything about Antipas other than what we see here. So what we know is he was faithful and he was faithful unto death and he was faithful unto death as a testimony, right? And, and we hear the word martyr, but beyond that, that's the word we get witness or, um, you know, someone who testifies to something. And so Antipas obviously was faithful about that and would not deny the faith. So faith there should indicate more to us than simply the fact that he had faith in Jesus Christ. He was consistently faithful to the truth about Jesus Christ. 
And he would have been who one who said that in spite of all these pagan religions around and all of their temples and all that they are dedicated to, I am going to follow the way, the truth, and the life. So, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good compliment on Jesus' part for them to say that, you you know, you're holding fast uh, to who I am and what I represent, and you didn't deny me, uh, even in the days when he was martyred for that, you stayed faithful. Pretty good compliment. So we move on from that, though, pretty quickly. In verse 14, we see his him begin to have some criticisms. Verse 14, I have a few things against you, huh, not just one, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. And hear that phrase, stumbling block, and I know you guys know that, but um, it's important to this discussion to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. But how did he do that? That's what we will see in this church. So he says in verse 15, thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. And we'll speak about the Nicolaitans as well as we look at the pieces of the puzzle. Well, first of all, he says, you know, the, the problem is that you have there among your citizens, uh, you have among those citizens called the, your church, those who are believers, They, even though they're believers, they still have this other thing going on, this thing that he's calling the doctrine of Balaam. Well, what would that have been? Well, uh, I'm going to read you something that will be in your notes if you have them in front of you, and it's on page two if you're looking at the notes. You'll see my quote there. And it's in Numbers 31, 15, and 16. It says it records that Moses said to the children of Israel, Have you saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. The doctrine of Balaam, therefore, was the teaching that the people of God should intermarry with the heathen and compromise in the matter of religious worship. So what we have is this city, Pergamos. We have a church of believers or citizens in that, in that city, and they are surrounded by all these other pagans. And so what you have in the church are those who, while they are citizens, they are saying, oh, it's not that big of a deal to compromise in the sense that I can marry an unbeliever. I can marry a pagan. And even if they go to the Temple of Venus, um, I know what I believe and I've trusted in Jesus. So, you know, um, we'll make that work. And you can imagine uh, there's this single guy in the church of Pergamos, and he's walking down the street there in town, and he sees this really pretty woman, and she likes him, and he likes her, and she seems to be agreeable to, you know, be the, the woman in his life, and he's thinking, look, you know, I kind of want to get married. Um, you know, I don't know about y'all, but for me, there's some pretty easy relevance, you know, to our culture and time. And in Israel's case, it brought about their, you know, their judgment because they were doing more and more of that because of Balaam's counsel. They, they were uh, intermarrying with the, with the pagans around them. And eventually the influence of their wives in that case, uh, were, they were leading them the wrong direction. And I know in my case, I've known many, many men who have said, and it can work both ways, but I just speak from my own experience. Uh, many men who have said, no, 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 you know, it's all right. Um, she's agreeable and I love her and she loves me. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to be, it'll be better when we get married. And, uh, you know, I'm going to do the missionary dating thing and it'll be all okay. And you wonder why Paul might have said, you know. Not not all that get an idea to be unwe unequally yoked. Come out from their midst and be separate. 
um, still still is a very good counsel. And, uh, you know, I know for a lot of those men, it didn't work out the way they thought it did. And as a matter of fact, it ended up kind of taking them the wrong direction. And over a period of time, if they wanted to save the marriage, um, it cost them and it cost them not in a good way. So, you know, I, I think the, the, what Jesus is saying here is, is not only appropriate to Pergamos and what they were encountering, but uh, it speaks to our, our culture and our experience as well. So, uh, you know, he says, not only that, but you, you have this, those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And again, remembering that this is sort of the, the, when the church sort of became a hybrid, you, know, you take all the pagan churches and you say, no, 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 you're Christian now. You're, you're with Jesus now. And you put all those ideas and you mush them together and you say, oh, it's, this is what Christianity is going to look like from now on. And we still see the consequences of those wrong and faulty beliefs. But where did this come from? Well, the Nicolaitans were, uh, many believe, sort of early Gnostics. They would have uh, said things from Greek philosophy like the flesh is evil and the physical is evil and the spiritual is good. So what we need to do is we need to seek to be in the spiritual realm and think about spiritual things, but those have absolutely nothing to do with the physical realm or the flesh. So that led them to the place where they said, well, you know, I can think about spiritual things, but my flesh may be doing whatever it is because it's evil anyway. So it's okay if my flesh is doing something like uh, immorality, uh, because that's my flesh. My flesh is evil anyway. Well, we know that has absolutely nothing to do with scripture. You know, it's sort of this huge, like, whoa, how does this work for the early Greeks to hear that Jesus was God, but became flesh? That doesn't work for us because of their philosophy. There were um, heresies that existed in the early church because of that Greek influence that came into the church and said, well, Jesus wasn't really fully human. He didn't really become flesh. So again, all of those ideas came from outside the church and sort of filtered into the church. And do we see some of them today? Absolutely. We have a couple of huge, um, I don't know, celebrations maybe might be a reasonable word. And most of you know what those two things that I'm about to mention. And those come directly from those ideas and the church being influenced by those pagan ideas. And those two celebrations, uh, one occurs in New Orleans, it's called Mardi Gras. And the other one occurs in Rio de Janeiro, it's called Carnival. And Carnival uh, is made up of two parts, Carne and Festival. So it is a flesh festival. And that's where it comes from. And if you notice the spiritual or religious background for those celebrations, you will know where they came from. And you probably also know that after those celebrations where people are told to sort of get the flesh out and let their body sort of do what it wants to do during that time, uh, almost immediately after we have something called Lent. And if you know anything about Lent, the idea is that, well, now that we've done that and now that we've sort of gotten it out of our system now we can focus more fully on spiritual things and reject the flesh and one of the things that we can do to reject the flesh so that we can focus on the spiritual is give something up okay um guess what none of those ideas have any basis in scripture those are from paganism and those are the ideas that jesus is confronting right here. So, uh, and Jesus says, as a matter of fact, in verse 15, you know, those kinds of things, I hate them. They're, they're not, they're not right. They're not truth. So, you know, what we end up with, what we want to think about is their situ, their particular situation, because we're going to find that as we go through a few of these churches, there's sort of this 
forward progression from, you know, the, the outer influence is sort of getting in and in and into the church and among citizens in more and more ways. But before we go there, uh, just if we're going to stay with Pergamos, what we'll find is there ended up being three groups. And he's talking about this church through what he says as three groups based on what we know and what we know about the doctrine of Balaam. Here's what we got. The first group would be the group that would say, uh, we're faithful to Jesus. We're sticking with the truth. We're going to stay with him. We're going to walk in relationship with him. We know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And I have to be connected to him if I'm to accomplish anything. Apart from him, I can do nothing. So I need to stay faithful to him, not only in my actions, but in terms of my beliefs and what I what I know to be the truth. And I will stay faithful to that. You have those within the church at Pergamos, citizens and faithful citizens or good citizen. You also had, and it's what part of what Jesus is addressing here, you also have this other group or second group that has said, well, you know, yes, we're citizens, but no, it's really not that big of a deal to intermarry because hopefully what we'll do is we'll pull them our direction, which of course rarely works, but uh, that's the way they were thinking. So they are intermarrying. So here they are among this group of citizens. And while they are citizens, they are intermarrying with people who are not citizens. In other words, unbelievers, the pagans from the city of Pergamos. Then you have the third group, and that would be primarily the people with whom they intermarried. So if we're talking about the church there, Two groups of citizens and one group that is not citizens. You have the citizens who are faithful, the citizens who are compromising by intermarrying. And then the third group is the people with whom they intermarried who are not citizens. They are not the church. Okay. So that being said, and, and understanding why Jesus is upset because he doesn't want that to happen, didn't work for Israel didn't work for Paul in terms of the way that he taught about it. And it shouldn't work for us, you know? So Jesus is confronting this church on that basis. And what does he tell them in verse 16? This is one of those places where we should read slowly, read slowly. And what we'll find is um, we're paying attention that uh, there's so much packed into verse 16 that we need to see. All right. Um, number one, he's gonna. He says, "Tell he t commands them to repent." So again, change your thinking, change your direction, change the way you're 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 doing things. And who is he really speaking to? He's speaking to that sort of subgroup or second group, right? Um, because there are those within that group of citizens who are being faithful, absolutely, but there are those who are not. So he says, yeah, change your thinking, change your thinking. Don't put up with this. Don't compromise, be faithful. And specifically what I would say is in this context, because he's talking about the doctrine of Balaam, right? And the stumbling block that that doctrine creates is saying, get rid of the stumbling block. And the way you do that, the kind of repenting that you would want to do would be to change your thinking in terms of what the truth is and sticking with the truth. And that that effect that that affects not just what you believe, but what you believe affects what you do. And so what he's saying is change your thinking because in your environment, you're thinking that's okay. And it's affecting what you do and what you're doing is creating a stumbling block and it's taking people the wrong direction. So he says, you know, stop, change your thinking. And part of that for us and the practical piece for us is know the truth, discern the truth and stay with the truth. Know what the truth is. In our present culture, you know, so many Christians I talk to, do you, like, do you know what you believe? 
do you know what the Bible teaches about this or this or this or this? And no, 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 I just believe in Jesus. I was like, well, no wonder you could be misled. No wonder you could be carried about by every wind of doctrine because you don't know why, what you believe or why you believe it. So for Jesus to have confronted them on the basis of the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and saying, no, repent, change your thinking. Again, that points me back to the repentance he's really pointing to is the repenting about your, what you believe and how what you believe affects what you do. And in order to do that, you have to know what you believe. But beyond that, after he tells them that, after he commands them to change your thinking, he says, if you don't, I will come to you quickly. And then let's read slowly. Notice what he says next. I will come to you quickly and I will fight against them. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I have heard a lot of teaching about this church and I have almost never heard anybody talk about this verse and how it distinguishes between coming to you and fighting against them. Hmm. If you're thinking about their context, though, remember you have those three groups. You have the group that is faithful, the good citizens. You have the citizens who are compromising by marrying non-citizens, right? And then you have the non-citizens whom they marry who are trying to lead them the wrong direction because of their beliefs and because of their practices. So Jesus says, no, 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 I'm the king. If, if you don't repent, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to fight against them. I'm going to fight against them with the sword, the thing that brings truth. So, um, you know, th this is very, very, you know, very practical for us in the sense that there's going to be a judgment, not only between right, and wrong, good and evil, but between truth and falsehood. In Pergamos, there was a strong relationship between the civic and religious culture. In both their situation and ours, however, the true church is encouraged to reject both false doctrine and false practice. Stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. Stay close to the truth. Know your Bible well enough to discern between those true things and those other doctrines that are out there. So, uh, Jesus says, look, if, if you don't change your thinking, I'm going to have to fight against them because they're hurting you, my people. <laughs> All right. So we move forward from there. And one of the things that we see is uh, in 17, Jesus gives them actually three promises. And if you haven't, haven't, uh, heard any of my discussion in terms of what an overcomer is and and why we wouldn't want to translate it as somebody who might overcome or somebody who needs to try to overcome uh and instead why we would look at this uh, verse 17 and and see to him who overcomes as a citizen or as a believer uh, please go back we've got the the earlier videos around what that looks like and and you can look at that discussion but I'm going to, from now on, especially just look at this section of each church and say, he's talking to believers and he's giving them a promise. And we see the fulfillment of each of these promises in each of these churches fulfilled in Revelation 20 through 22. So uh, verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So um, we see that in every letter, of course, as well. So to the overcomer. I will give him three things. Let's look at those three things. I'll give him some of the hidden manna to eat. That's promise number one. Promise number two, I will give him a white stone, whatever that is. And then number three, on the stone, I'll give him a new name written, which no one ex knows except him who receives it. And again, that's the same kind of free phrase. I would translate it as no one knows it except the receiver the receiving one. So same kind of phrase as overcomer. So the overcomer, I'm going to give him hidden manna, give him white stone, I'm going to give him new name, 
And the only person who's going to know the new name is the receiver or recipient, if you want to say it that way. First prompt, he says, I'll give them the hidden manna. Hidden manna, there's two possible ways to understand that. And I, I think you and I would be good with either one. Uh, wouldn't be dogmatic about either one. I think they both make good sense. Number one is that that hidden manna is refers to sort of the hidden manna that was hidden in the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of, Ark of the Covenant is the idea of God's uh, presence and provision and, and power and authority. And so with the manna that was hidden there, and of course we see that in Revelation, when the heavens are opened and they show the temple in heaven, what do you see? You see the Ark of the Covenant. So in the future, we're going to be with God and he's going to be templing or tabernacling among us. So uh, we'll have that. We'll have his presence and provision and um, protection and all those kinds of things will be happening in the future that we will be a part of. And every citizen will be a part of it. So that's one of the possibilities for manna. Uh, the other idea for hidden manna that some people uh, talk about is, is Jesus being the manna. And the reference there comes from John 6. And if you look at John 6, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the manna that came down from heaven, uh, or that comes down from heaven. So Jesus refers to himself as the manna. And Jesus at this present time is hidden from us. So the idea here would be, since Jesus would be the bread of life or the manna, uh, and he's hidden right now in the future as an overcomer, as a citizen, as a believer, I will experience Jesus. I will be with Jesus. I'll be in his presence. and He will bring me uh, nourishment, fulfillment for eternity. So it's a great promise. And it's true for every believer, of course. Uh, either way you go, that's a win. I invite you to hold your conviction. I don't think it's a thing where we debate. I think it's where we go. Yeah, they're both good. <laughs> sure, they're both good answers. Uh, no problem with either one. We'll find a very similar situation when we go to the second promise, which is uh, I'll give him a white stone. We think about a white stone and go, okay, uh, what on earth is that? And what kind of promise is that? Well, there's a lot of uh, things going on with uh, white stone in history and in that ancient culture. So I want to give you a few of the ideas or, as possibilities as we look at the white stone, and then uh, we can talk about what what the best options might be from it. And if you on your notes, I give it to you in uh, page four, that uh, there's a historian and theologian that uh, wrote about the possibilities. He says, pebbles of various colors were used for admission to public celebrations. Well, if we're talking about a celebration that we are invited to, and not only us, but uh, every believer, right? All citizens are, are invited to come to this particular celebration. Think about Revelation 19. Think about the marriage feast that will take place when Jesus comes again to set up his kingdom. If you look at Revelation 19, you'll know all believers are part of that celebration. So to think about the white stone as the, you know, here's your admission, come on in. Uh, beautiful promise. If that's all, as far as we go, that would be a wonderful thing. Uh, however, there are more possibilities. So we see a black stone was the sacred symbol of the infamous Asian goddess Sibylle. And, you know, if we look at it from that perspective, it's like black is evil and falsehood and false practice and false doctrine, whereas white would be truth and purity and righteousness. So, okay, I can go with that. Um, you know, if we want to go that direction beyond that, he says, uh, white stones were used for medical purposes. Okay. So if we think about a, some kind of connection with healing, well, in the future, Every believer is not going to only experience a little bit of healing. We're going to have a glorified body that is absolutely perfectly incorruptible. You know, no more need for healing when we're at that point. We get that white stone. And it's like, yep, I'm done, man. I don't need anything more. So if that's all we went for, 
that would be a great reason to, to talk about Jesus giving us a white stone. But there is more. Uh, next thing, he says, perhaps somewhat more significantly, and I would agree with him on this, jurors use black stones to vote for a person's guilt, but white stones to vote for one's innocence. <laughs> Well, folks, because of Jesus Christ, we have been declared innocent. We have been justified by our faith in him. So for us, every believer has that, and every believer gets the white stone. So what a beautiful promise. And it's not on the basis of what we do, and it's not on the basis of our perseverance. It's on the basis of what Jesus did on the cross. So that white stone is given to us because we are a citizen and we are a citizen because of Jesus and because of what he accomplished. So you know, all of those pieces fit together so beautifully in the picture of a white stone given uh, to tell us like, yep, I'm, I'm giving you this to tell you, yes, you are. I'm de I am declaring you innocent. I'm the king. I'm declaring you innocent. Beautiful. Love it. All right. Um, and all, like I said, all of those things would be true of every believer. If, if uh, we move forward, though, and, and again, whatever you do, whatever idea you associate with that white stone, it's a beautiful promise to every believer. So third promise is not only do you get the white stone and all, you know, sort of all these ideas associated with it. But on the stone, you get a new name, which no one knows except him who receives it. This is really very, very cool. And again, something that's fulfilled in uh, Revelation 19 to 22, you get this idea of a new name. Uh, when Jesus comes, he's got a name written on his thigh and on his robe. And he has a, he has a new name that only he knows. It's like he's the only one who knows it. And we look at those kinds of things and say, new name, don't, don't really get it. Well, um, in ancient culture, and I'll, this is also in your notes, in ancient culture, a person's name was an indication of their relationship and their identity. And our names now, you know, we have a last name that talks about our family and we get, we're given a first name by our parents and, you know, middle name that may or may not have anything to do with anything, but, um, uh, you know, in many, many cultures, if there are two or three names, they all have some kind of significance. And in ancient culture, it was a huge thing. And just talk about the name Benjamin or, or Joshua or Yeshua. Uh, you know, all these names had, had really, you know, amazing uh, significance. You know, Zechariah, my God remembers. Those kinds of things. You say, wow. Uh, very cool. But uh, in this case, it's a, uh, you know, it, it says uh, with indication of their relationship and their identity, uh, as well as their reputation. For example, when Jesus says to the church at Pergamos that they hold fast to my name, he's saying that they have a reputation for honoring their relationship with Jesus by their words and their actions. Hmm. Okay. So to be given a new name by a superior indicates that a person has been given a new identity with new responsibilities. So if we think about it from a scriptural perspective, we know about that on at least a couple of occasions. We know that Jesus, when he uh, ran into the, the, his disciple Peter, his name wasn't Peter. It was Jesus who said to him, like, okay, you're now, you're now my disciple. Here's your new name. Uh, he wasn't the only one. Read a little bit further. You read the book of Acts. You see this guy named Saul who was killing believers. And then all of a sudden, you know, he has an encounter with Jesus. And what happens? <laughs> he gets a new name. So, you know, here we have that same idea with a couple of little, little, bit, of, little bit of difference. Because uh, one of the things that we see in this particular equation is that Jesus says, uh, you're, this this new name that I'm going to give you, nobody else knows it. Only you. What that should say to us and what makes this an incredibly beautiful promise is Jesus saying, it's only you and me. This is about my relationship with you individually and uniquely. 
And only you and I are going to know that name that I'm going to give to you. And for me, I just listen to that. Man, you know, Jesus is telling me I am unique and that he wants to have a unique relationship with me. And his love for me is unique. And, you know, what, a, what an interesting way to say that. So, you know, is that a beautiful promise? I would hope you would agree. You know, so um, in any case, that points to our eternal identity as sons and daughters of God, and not just that, but to our unique identity as children of God and as individual children of God. Beautiful, beautiful picture that we see at the tail end of this church. So, and once again, I would tell you uh, this for me, you know, speaking to this church that is sort of beginning to feel the influence of not only false doctrine, but false practice from the outside, sort of sneaking into the church. And as we look at the next church, what we'll find is that it just gets, you know, it gets worse as we move into the church at Thyatira. But Jesus is very clear of saying, like, look, you want to stay true. You want to stay focused. You want to have the discernment so that you can reject not only false doctrine, but false practice. And in the midst of that, he says, look, you're my citizen. As my citizen in the future, look at this. So you, get a, you get a new stone. You get the hidden manna. The new stone that I'm going to give you, it's going to have a new name. You and me, that's it. So God bless y'all.